So I am really glad you're back on. And I love your sweatshirt. Yeah. And I, it, we kept trying to make this happen, but you had a work schedule that um, I do well in the mornings and you are not here in the mornings. I know. <laughs> Darn. Um, but your sweatshirt is amazing. I am digging all the spoons. Yeah. All my spoons there. Yes. That is fabulous. I think in pride colors. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That is fantastic. Um, I want to kind of like refresh because some people might not have seen or heard your episode where you told us everything that's going on with you. So if you want to give us a little roundup on what's going on. Sure. Um, so I'm Julie. I about two years ago started having some weird symptoms. Um, in the fall of 2017, I had a little bit of symptoms and they weren't too bad. They kind of went away, kind of unexplained. And then starting in March of 2018, they came on really, really badly. Severe pain was my main symptom, but then I also had other things like brain fog and like massive fatigue. Um, a few times I passed out, things like that. Long story short, doctors visits, hospital visits, etc. Lots of scans and things. Eventually, got diagnosed with a disorder called Nutcracker syndrome. Um, and I know it gets you every time. It really does. <laughs> But the funny thing was, is like, I hadn't heard of it, and all of a sudden your episode went, and we got a ton of emails from people going, okay, yes, I have this too, and no one else has heard of it. So it was, it was a really interesting, uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's not made up, I promise. Um, nothing to do with ballet or the holidays or anything like that. Um, so what happens is, like, so let's say my fist is my kidney and my finger would be the vein that comes out of the kidney. So your kidney filters the blood um, and then brings fresh blood back to your body. So you should have two arteries that open nice and wide around it, about a 90-degree angle. Mine was squished so tight it was less than a 20-degree angle. So that's why they call it nutcracker syndrome because it's like a nut being squished in a nutcracker. So it causes all this back pressure and uh, that what causes a lot of the pain. Also, since not much of my blood was getting through, I was more than 75% blocked. Um, so the kidney was making their own collateral veins elsewhere, which are new veins, and some of those were wrapping around my spine. So that's why I had a lot of um, nerve damage and uh, nerve pain and things too. Um, eventually, bopping around specialist to specialist, eventually Kaiser got me to be able to be referred to UCSD Transplant Center, um, and they were able to give me in the fall of 2018, so it's been a bit over a year now, about a year and three months or so. Um, I had a kidney auto transplant, so they took my left kidney, which, by the way, if you didn't hear my first episode, that's my only kidney. Um, so ever since I was a baby, I didn't have a right kidney. So my left kidney had to be transported to my right pelvis. So now all that anatomy is down in my right pelvis. So I've been um, in recovery ever since the fall of 2018. So that's kind of a recap of my disorder and my Treatment. That was a very good recap, and the, yeah, I've explained it a few times. You, you really have it down. Um, I think most of us do. We have our elevator pitch for our disorders, yeah, where we can like, just go okay, through the basics. <laughs> like here's here's the ten minute pitch. Um, you definitely don't want to buy into any of these disorders. That's the ten minute pitch. Um, you also are a teacher, and I was um, just amazed at how your disability works with teaching and how long you arbitrarily get to recover right uh so we, as teachers we actually don't get like the state the government disability so very fortunately i had listened to a very wise mentor teacher of mine many years ago and signed up for like our teacher disability um so i had been paying my like monthly fee for it and you know with the thought of like oh, i'm never really going to use this or at least not anytime you know maybe when i'm older i'll use it or something but for whatever reason i listened to her and i signed up in my 20s and then wouldn't you know it in my early 30s i was already applying for it um so i fortunately with my district we're allowed to save our unused sick days and in the past i had always been like pretty good at not really using them so i actually had almost two months worth of sick days and my personal days not used that we get to roll over each year i had been in my district about nine years by the time i got sick so i had like 50 or 60 almost um 
and use days. So at first, you use all those up when you're out. Um, so I was being paid full time in the beginning. And then once those uh, got used up, then I could start applying my disability. But of course, that's only like a percentage of your salary. It's not full salary. So to go from being able to work full time to all of a sudden I'm getting like two thirds pay, like if that, you know, on top of now I have a ton of medical bills and I mean, I was buying devices and things left and right. Like, you know, I had to have a walker for a while. I bought that. I had to use a cane. At one point it was so bad. I had to buy a wheelchair, um, you know, going through heating pads and all kinds of things. So you're getting paid less and you have all these extra expenses. So it's that, truly that the most expensive it. hobby ever. Like <laughs> there's no more expensive hobby than disability and chronic illness. Yes. Yeah. For some reason at one point I was like writing down everything I was spending money on. And my husband was like, why are you doing this? I was like, I don't know. For some reason like I wanted to keep track of how much it cost. And then it was just getting, like, once I hit the thousand dollar mark, I was like, in like a few months, I was like, wow, this is really depressing. And he's like, stop. <laughs> this is like, stop. Like, well, then if you need it, like you don't need to feel bad about how much money or you don't have to like pay us back or something. Like, why are you writing it down? I don't know. <laughs> I actually do the same thing. It used to be that you could take it off of your taxes if it ended up being a certain percentage of your income. Uh, but it's, uh, I think the law's changed on that. Um, if anyone who's listening outside of the United States is wondering what we're talking about, we're saying sick days. You don't get to just stay home if you're sick. You um, hopefully work for something that's big enough that either has instilled sick days or you are gifted <laughs> sick days. And those are the amount of days per year that you can be not at work because you are sick. So like my husband has 14 days, I think a year that he can be sick. That's it. If he's sick other than that, then either he has to take a vacation time or he just has to go in or he could get fired. So just, you know, anyone who's in a sane country where this is you stay home if you have the flu or you stay home if you've had surgery or <laughs> any of these things, that's just kind of what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, so I was pretty good for a while. I did have to do a couple of weeks without any pay at all um, because my recovery took a little bit longer than expected. And um, even my disability time had run out. So my sick days ran out and then I had disability for a few months and then I still wasn't quite ready to go back. So there was like close to three weeks where I just like didn't have any pay at all. Um, and part of why I did push to go back is because my insurance was about to run out at work. So here I am like with all these terrible issues, just having massive surgery. And they're like, you come back this month or you don't have insurance. And I was like, wow, okay, I guess I'm coming back next month. Yeah. And then so, sidebar again for our people outside the United States, our insurance is tied to our employers. That's, yeah. yeah, just, <laughs> we don't get it through the government. We, we have to get through working with our in employers. That's right. beyond cruel. Did they have any other solutions for you or is it just come back or else uh, you lose insurance? I could have paid, but it would have been like astronomical to pay for the insurance, like the COBRA kind of Yeah, we were like almost 2000 a month when they offered COBRA to us. Yeah. So it's like, okay, so I wouldn't be getting paid if I stayed out longer and I'd have to pay all this money in insurance. Like we, we ran out of our savings. Like we've been pretty good. My husband and I with, you know, always having money in the bank as savings just in case something happens. And then it was like, okay, so we'll dip into our savings this month for this bill. Okay. We're we'll dipping into our savings for this month. And then it was like, wow, we're like almost are at zero. Yeah. Yep. Definitely, definitely need to push to go back to work then. So what happened was, I know you were like still using a wheelchair, you had some colleagues who helped you, but you're, it sounded like the school you were at was not terribly accessible. No, um, my high school that I work at is kind of built like into the side of a big huge hill. So we have multiple levels of our school and then the building that I'm in, I'm on the second floor. So uh, and the other thing is we're very spread out. It's almost more like a college campus, like how big it is. Um, so like from the parking lot back to my room, which of course is like the opposite side of campus in the back corner upstairs. So even just physically getting from the parking lot to my car takes many minutes, even for a healthy person, let alone someone who's, you know, struggling. So um, 
part of me waiting to go back was like, can I physically walk that distance? Can I physically walk up the stairs in case the elevator's not working? Um, I'm in a science lab, so the doors are really heavy because they do this special like blast proof door. So like even when I was sick, like I could barely even push open my own classroom doors because it was so heavy. Um, and I was in talks with the principals about like, do we maybe need to put in one of those little buttons to open it? And like, how would that work with a science door? And da 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 da. So like all of these physical things um, were part of the reason why I stayed out. Um, originally, the surgeons had said for healing, but now I realize they meant just like physical healing was like three to four months after surgery so that's what I originally told my principal at least three to four months and then maybe I can come back which would have put me at coming back at like January time last year uh, but as it got closer and closer I'm like you know would try to do like little walks with the dogs or other like activities at home and I would get so tired that I'm like I don't think I can go back after four months um, I fortunately had a fabulous long-term sub. She did a wonderful job, so she was doing great with the classroom, so I didn't have to worry about that. Um, but originally, I was going to see if she could job share in January, and at first, it didn't sound like she wanted to. So it was like, if I come back in January after the holidays, I'd have to come back full-time. And there was no way that I was making it full-time. Plus, I live about 30 miles from my school, so it was also commuting in the car all that distance. Um, so after talking to my surgeons, they're like, yeah, no, we're not going to clear you to go back to work full-time. So then I had to go back to my school and be like, yeah, I'm not coming back in January. <laughs> I can't do it. Um, we're on a trimester schedule, so the grading period ends in the very beginning of March and then a new one begins. So March was six months after surgery for me. So I was like, okay, that could be a little bit more reasonable. So I wound up staying at home an extra two months. Um, and that's where it got me into like a few weeks of not having pay, but it was worth it for me to be home and just rest a bit longer. Um, and then just from March to June, I was like, okay, that's only a three month period before summer. Like I could push it and, you know, try to get through it and then I'll have summer to rest. So we decided to just let me wait until that grading period was going to switch over. Um, so I would have like a fresh group of students and, you know, be able to come back at a better time than like the middle of the year. So we wound up doing that. Um, and then at that time, I did recontact my long term sub. And with it being March, it was kind of a weird time of the year. And she was like, I don't see any other job opening. So yeah, I will job share with you. So she stayed on 50% and I took 50%. Um, and then she let me do the morning classes. Because like you, I do better in the mornings too. Um, are you still there? Oh, I'm still here. Skype is um, definitely not our friends. We, we switched over to Zoom, and it's definitely not fun. Okay. Yeah, that's why we switched over to Zoom. <laughs> uh, Skype uh -huh. is uh, super unreliable. Uh, but you were saying like you were able to take the morning. Did that mean you had to take the 50% pay cut as well? Yes. Oh. Yes. I went back to work, but I didn't make much because, um, you know, I wanted to try to go back and I thought it would be a good idea physically and mentally to try just part time. Um, so I did the 50 percent. I got the mornings and then I would get to leave uh, at like lunchtime. -ish. I would usually eat lunch at school and then I would go home after that. And then my long term sub would do the afternoon classes for me. Um and but yeah, that meant I only got paid fifty percent, and then it meant my insurance was quadruple the price that it normally is. It's pretty crazy. Uh, yeah, I just we're in like not just as much as normal, quadruple the yeah. cost as normal. So like my actual take home pay was like hardly anything at all. <sighs> And like you and I, we got get along so well because we, we're in like pretty similar situations and things. And one of the things that we have is we are married and we have a partner who works full time. And so like that's like as insane as people are who are listening in other countries are going, oh my god, you people in America are like going bankrupt and dying. Yeah, we are. That's absolutely true. That's not overestimating this. But we're lucky enough that we have a spouse who brings home money. Like if you had to do this and you were living on your own in an apartment or in a house that right. you owned, you wouldn't be able to make your mortgage during that time. Like 
Yeah. Like, there's no way you can, uh, this is, a, I'm so sorry to like hijack, but this is like something that we're in the okay. middle of like dealing with right now, talking to my husband's bosses because they just changed our insurance to $6,000 deductible. So that means we have to pay $6,000 before the insurance does anything. Yeah. And then it's only 85%. And I was trying to explain it to my parents. I was like, we don't know if we can stay here because there's no way to save enough money to make sure you don't go bankrupt because yeah. one hospital visit here can cost $200,000 even without staying. If you just go in and get the test done, it can be $200,000. So it's it's not anything you can ever plan for. Like, And so yeah. with, with what you're saying, like where you're like, okay, I'm going back half time, but I don't even get any take home for that. And already are pushed to your physical limit and right. almost going against doctor's orders. Like, it's mm -hmm. just baffling right now. I'm sorry if I'm a little distracted today. This is, like, seriously something we are just dealing with last night. <laughs> it's like, what are we going to do? Yeah. Uh, I know. It's, it's, it's also crazy. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I mean, I'm on disability. You're teaching. Like, you would think that the teachers would be taken better care of. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's where, like, you know, everyone talks about the inspiration porn where there's, like, a teacher who is going through chemo and all the other teachers band together and donate their sick days so the teacher can go get chemotherapy. And everyone's like, oh, that's yeah. great and lovely. It's like, yeah, the people are lovely. The system is cruel. <laughs> like, yeah. It's not that it had to come to that. Right? right? <laughs> and teachers, like, the people we need to be there to... <laughs> to do things. Like, it's, it's insane to me. So how have you done your... Um, you're just finishing up winter break. Yeah. So luckily, um, I had uh, two weeks off right now. So let's go back a little bit. So I went back in the spring of last year, 50%, um, just mornings, and I just had two classes. They're like both about 70 minutes long, um, and they were both the same thing. So luckily, I just had one class to prep, and I'm a science teacher, so it was just, you know, if there was ever labs, it would just be one lab to prep. Um, I would usually set it up, and then the other teacher would finish out and, like, clean everything up. So it was really nice. We kept, like, taking turns, helping each other. Um, I knew the material better because I had been teaching for longer. She was a newer teacher. Um, so I would usually do a lot more of the planning. But, like, if I was ever having a bad day or something, I'd be like, I'm so sorry. Can you do tomorrow's lesson? Like, I have to go home and rest. And she would. And it was, you know, it was always great. And, you know, it was nice to work with, like, a newer person and, you know, new with, the, like, the standards. I was in school over 10 years ago, so I'm sure the standards are a little bit out of practice for me. So it was nice to have somebody to work with again and fresh eyes and things. So that was really fun um and then I had the summer to just rest I was like I'm not sometimes I would you know do a, a summer camp or, or professional development but this summer I was like nope I'm not doing anything I just rested it's like it's not worth it for me to try to do anything so just rested and then in the fall which is really August end of August we went back to school and I took on a few more um hours so I was up to 75 percent um, so pay went up a little bit and then insurance cost a little bit less than what it was before. So not as good as it is, but when I could be full time, but a little bit better. Um, now I'm up to two classes, two separate classes that I prep for. So it's a little bit more work and the long term stuff. She was able to get her own job at a different school. Um, she and I still keep in touch because she has great ideas and stuff. So we'll be like, oh, here's a PowerPoint I did or a lesson. Um, so that's been really nice to be like, hey, do you already have a quiz for this? Or um, So we'll, we'll share with each other. But unfortunately, we don't get to work together anymore. Um, so that was a big adjustment to go back to like, okay, now it's just me and just this class. And now I have two classes to prep for. So that was a big change um, to have to worry about. Do I have both the lessons ready for tomorrow or both labs or both the activities, both the material? Um, so that was that was quite a bit extra <laughs> to do, plus extra classes of students. So that meant more grading, more time, you know, with things like that. Um, so a little bit tougher. Um, was able to kind of handle it okay. Um, only had to take a few sick days so far this year. Um, trying to save them for like if I ever get like real bad or anything like that. Um, but the big thing was this December started a new trimester for us and that's where I had to be full time. So I've done about three weeks so far completely full time hours and that has been really tough. <laughs> 
<laughs> How was the support with the administration with your bosses? Um, they are great. However, it's a little bit strange because my principal, who I've been working with for almost 10 years, he had this dream of eventually moving his family to another country, and they did that last um, summer. Oh, I believe it moved over the summer. So new administration. Um, they kind of knew me a little bit from last year, but they didn't know the whole story. And then one of the assistant principals is totally brand new. Like, so she had no idea at all. So I had to, like, at the beginning of the school year, plus we had a bunch of new teachers. So I just did another email, like, hi, in case all of you don't know, like, this is me and this is my story. And I sent them a link to an article from UCSD that I was in and a link to your podcast. Ah, yay. And I was like, this is me in case you want to learn more about me. Like, you see me just walking around and you probably don't realize, like, I've just gone through all this stuff. Um, so it was a little weird to have to like re-explain everything to everybody and um, kind of point out how serious it was because they just see me, you know, 30-something-year-old walking around like, oh, well, I'm like, okay, you know, they wouldn't think anything, you know, special. Um, so if there are ever times where they see me like sitting down all flushed or whatever, they're like, what's going on? I'm like, remember the little yep. kidney transplant thing? And I, oh, 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 that was you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, you work at a really big school. It's not like, you know, in some of the smaller towns where it's just, you know, a, yeah, cool. one yeah. building. I mean, you're almost like at a junior college with. Yeah. Yeah. So they've been great, but um, sometimes they just have to remind them of like, okay, I'm, I'm still in recovery. I'm still not 100% back. And I think people in general are, if they haven't been through anything big or like, oh, you know, it's been a year or so, you're just recovered and you're better, right? You're back to normal. And it's like, well, I don't think I'm ever really going to be back to what I was before I got sick. And yes, I am so much better than I was. Like, don't get me wrong. This surgery did fix my nutcracker and that pain is gone. But I still have a lot of like lingering aches and pains and soreness. Um, I can do a lot more than I could before, but... I still have to limit myself with, like, how much activity I do. Um, I still need to be careful of, like, what I eat. There's still some food that, like, really upset my stomach. I'm sure you can understand all the different medicines I was on, like, just totally wrecked my, you know, GI tract. So there's still stuff that I eat, and I'm like, oh, bad idea. Let me go get my digestive tubes and my tongues. And, yeah, there's, there's still some lingering stuff going on. That was the other issue last night was I, my husband had a, not what I would call a fight, but a uh, come to Jesus moment. Um, it was a very like just the discussion on how you time your medication and like just trying to explain to him like if you're home two hours later, I've completely switched what medicines I took. Like, because, yeah. you know, it's it's that kind of thing where people don't, if you don't have a medication grouping where you're like, okay, I can take this, but I'm going to be completely a zombie. Or I can take this, right. but this can be a huge digestive issue, so I don't want to go out if I take this pill. Like, right. I need to yeah. be near the bathroom if I'm going to take this one. Like, it's just, it's hard yeah. to explain to people, like, how much you have to factor into your life. Like, what you eat, what, what you can ingest, and what you can ingest with what pill at what time. Like, there's right. a lot of mental and gymnastics. <laughs> Yeah, um, over the summer, I weaned off of gabapentin was my like Ooh. final nerve pain meant. So I, I, in the fall of last year, I was able to wean off the narcotics and eventually wean off of the um, muscle pain medicine. But then I finally weaned off of the gabapentin and, oh my gosh, detox was horrible from that. Like, I don't think people understand, like, oh, you just don't take that medicine anymore. And, like, thank <laughs> oh. goodness I decided to wait till summer when I wasn't working that I had that opportunity because it was awful. Like, I felt like a crazy drug addict or something. Like, several weeks of, like, just horrible feelings and uh, upset stomach and headaches and, you know, it was just terrible. Like, feeling jittery and shaky and like just having to deal with all of that. Like you think you're better and you're like, Oh, it's a good thing to get off my medicine. And then I'm like, wait, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> Is this better than I'm off of it? Or should I just, keep it? <laughs> so were you like weaned off of it or did they just go, okay, this is the date you're done. No, we weaned off of it. We did um, slow it down because I was taking three a day. So then it was like a week of two a day and a week of one a day and then every other day. So it did take several weeks to, to get off of it. But even still, like, 
just detoxing all of that out of your body. Um, and the other thing is with all my testing and whatnot, I found out that I had that MTHFR disorder, which um, is a genetic mutation uh, that has to do with uh, not being able to methylate fully as well. Um, and that's part of being able to detox things out of your body. So it makes you not as efficient as detoxing things. So here I am with all my surgeries and pain and stuff being on medication. And my body's having a hard time with it, so then I'm trying to wean off, but then again, my body's having a hard time detoxing it from it because I have this other genetic mutation. It's like, ah, <laughs> damn if I do, damn if I don't. <laughs> it really, like, it's, it is such a, like, uh, almost like Grecian Sisyphus sort of, like, underworld punishments of, like, yes, we can do this, and uh, this is going to happen and make it all not count or not work at all. That is insanity. How did it go with all the kids? Were they aware of what you were dealing with or were you? Yes. Um, I was very open with all my students and parents and whatnot. Um, so uh, but when I was still trying to work for a while, it was like a month and a half of me still trying to work when I was very, like, obviously openly sick. You know, you try to do your best as a teacher to not really show if you're not feeling well usually. But, I mean, you can do that if you, like, have a cold or something. But not when you're in the level of pain that I was in. Um, so at that point, the, my older students saw me getting that sick. So when they saw me coming back, they knew what happened. Um, they were very you know, supportive and happy to see me back and everything. Um, they've been great. The newer students who didn't know me at the time, like I had to kind of explain like, all right, so I'm only here in the mornings. If you need me, like, no, I'm not here in the afternoons. You have to email me. Or, you know, if you see me sitting down more, like I have to rest. So I, you know, kind of gave them the whole spiel. And I emailed all the parents with the link to my article, like, okay, this is what I just went through. And be patient with me if I, you know, take a while to grade your kid's paper or whatnot like I have a lot of doctor's appointments I need to rest a lot you know so I've been very open because I wanted people to know I didn't want them to just be like who's this teacher I'm like why is she taking forever or like what's wrong with her why is she taking all these sick days so I wanted them to you know be aware of everything and hopefully be a little empathetic rather than like you can green this quiz for a week you know just like come at me or something like Never. There's a reason why. Yeah, so look, the community has been very supportive. Managing expectations, I've learned, is like the most important thing anyone can do because where like big problems come up is because expectations weren't met. And I find that like true in just about everything. Yeah. So I've been very forward with pretty much everybody. <laughs> Friends, family, you know, other teachers, parents, students. Um some of them had seen me, like, wearing braces or using the cane or whatnot. Um, some of them had seen me sitting with the heating pad. So, like, I would just be very open. Like, I'm having pain today. I need to go sit down. You know, if you have a question, can you come up to me? Like, bring your computer up to me if you have a question. So, they've been pretty good about that. Um, they've also been really cute. Like, if I'm like, oh, can somebody pass out the papers for me? Yeah. Oh, I'll pass them out for you. You know, so, like, giving them more responsibility and and. and uh, you know, asking for help. Like, usually there's at least a couple of students who are very understanding and are excited to, you know, get up and be helpful. So that's been really good. I used to uh, be a long-term sub, and I was amazed, like, how, like, helpful is I had um, the same disorder I'd be long-term subbing the teacher for, but she had sick days I, as a substitute, didn't. So I would be in there having the same flair she was. And, like, I couldn't believe how great the students were. Like, a whole room full of 13-year-olds. And they were, like, the nicest people. Like, oh, you're having trouble walking. No worries. I got this. <laughs> like, wow, you guys are great. Yeah, every once in a while, they'll even tell me, like, you can go sit down now. <laughs> like, go rest. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, they get very for us, and they're teenagers. They're like, "Don't stand over us, go away, like, please." <laughs> like, you can just uh, if you don't see anything that's going on here, that's great too. <laughs> Is there anything yeah, you wanted so. us to update us on on what, what's going on with you and how everything's going? Are you all done with uh, the surgeries, or are you scheduled for more? Am, am I, I done with what? Are you done with all the surgeries now? Uh, as far as I know, yes, hopefully. Yeah, as far as our plans. Um, so that should be it. As far as surgeries go, um, I did like a lot of physical therapy, but I graduated from that a few months ago. Um, 
I was doing acupuncture and cupping and different things like that. Um, but I recently had stopped for those as well. Um, it was really hard to maintain going back to work and all the appointments. So part of it was like, I was doing better, but part of it is also like, how do I work and commute and fit this in? Um, so some of it was like, I was ready to be done. And some of it was more like, I kind of just have to take a break for now. Um, so overall, I'm doing a lot better and I have more energy. I'm able to do more, um, like help a little bit more around the house and things like that. But I still need to be careful and I still need to, um, you know, ask for help when needed. Um, a couple of things I, I wanted to mention, I wrote myself a little notes here. I forgot to mention when I went back to work, um, the very first few weeks I was so nervous about being back to work plus commuting. So my husband and I had saved up um, some money on the side and we rented an Airbnb that was a lot closer to my work. So for like the first almost three weeks, I just got to be like 10 minute drive to work and back and then I would be home and just rest. Um, so then he would do the commuting because we both work, of course, on opposite sides of the county. <laughs> um, so we picked an Airbnb that was much closer to my work for the time just to like make sure I was OK getting back to work and commuting. So any of you who are trying to work while you're disabled or, you know, after a surgery, you might want to consider making some concessions and, and doing some things. So doing the Airbnb a lot closer. Um, yeah, if you have the resources, really that's amazing. Like if you have that resource to be able to do that, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, because now that I'm back to just commuting myself, like it's that's that's rough. Like I'll get through my day and I'll be okay, and then you know an hour commute home. Then by then, like I'll just come in like a zombie. My husband's like, uh oh, bad day, bad commute. And like he's like, sit down. Here's a heating pad. I got dinner. <laughs> Seriously, he can just by looking at me, like what kind of day I've had, or how good or bad the traffic was that day. I mean, it's just like the thought of like commuting in traffic is just so like insurmountable. But like if you're not, if you don't have access to a vehicle and you have to like get on a bus, wait at a bus stop, get on a train, get to like, it's, it's so like, there's someone in my Elder Stainless group who has to do that just to get to physical therapy. And then like getting back, I'm like, I, I bow down and I'm so wishing there was some better way to like, I, I want Uber and Lyft to start subsidizing, um, car rides for disabled and people who need to get places because and not anyone who just needs to get anywhere of course they have a business model I'm just saying for like disabled people to get them to doctor's appointments or yeah. like they have billions and they they need a good you know a good PR wash really right now so I, I think they should step this up and they would get the tax write off I really think they should consider doing this for people yeah, I've been uh, thinking about stuff like that a lot lately because I keep seeing the commercials for like the American Cancer Society and all the stuff that they do for patients with cancer, which is phenomenal. That's fantastic. But if you don't have cancer and have a different disability, then you don't have free rides and you don't have free house cleaning and you don't have people bringing you meals. And it's like, okay, yes, I totally understand and I support that. But what about all the people who don't have cancer? Like we can't dip into that fund, but we still have problems so what's the organization for us to get free rides or for us to have people be our angels to clean our house once a month or whatever it is like what, what's that organization for, for yeah exactly our, and angels? <laughs> that's something um, even I've been talking about with the podcast is we wanted to grow it to becoming something bigger so that we can create something like that that is our end goal is that we'd be able to create a fund for people with disability and chronic illness that would be able to do that kind of support. I also want to make sure we have a, pol a political arm to have a lobby for chronic illness and disability to really push for universal design and, and slush funds like that for everyone. Yeah. yeah. So 20 years is the end goal on this. Hopefully we'll all be okay to, to do that. Okay. We'll see it one day. I'm hoping. I'm sure trying for it. <laughs> what other notes did you have on there? Um, oh, another thing that I started, which we've been having so much fun with, um, so just work alone and commuting basically takes all my energy, but then, you know, what do you do for the rest of life, like all your meals and your cooking and your dog walking and whatnot. Um, so I had realized that several of my other friends would usually do meal prep over the weekends too. 
And um, so I contacted them in the fall and was like, would you want to do meal prep together mm. rather than each of us doing our own and then having like a week's worth of the same meal um, that we get tired of. So once a week, usually on Sundays, as long as everybody's okay and like feeling up for it, we usually take turns at each other's houses. And one of the people is literally my next door neighbor. So that's very convenient. Um, so we, each couple is responsible for one meal and then we meet up and bring Tupperware and then we share all the meals that we make and then go home with like a week's worth of stuff. So that's been a big help. So those are our dinners throughout the week. So we just basically cook on some Saturdays or Sunday. Um, and then we meet our friends and then throughout the week, we just have stuff that we could heat up the microwave. So if I am having a really bad day or, you know, commuting was rough and, you know, bring on a flare or something, I can just go to the microwave and be like, okay, here's my pre-made meal and, and heat that up. So little tricks like that have been really helpful. That is brilliant. I mean, that's, that's an incredible <laughs> idea. If you have people around you, I like the one thing I just discovered is the Instapot. Like that's been everything for my family because you can do the meal prep in the morning when you have energy and, and make that. But that's such a great way to have like multiple meals. So that's the, the problem with meal yeah. prep is like, oh, if I see one more like mason jar salad, I'm going to kill someone. So Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're like, because my husband and I would kind of already meal prep, but it's like, okay, the fourth day of chili, like, I can't handle it, what the heck, so it was like, wait a second, you meal prep and you meal prep, can we just, like, swap meals, and then you just have a day or two of each one, so you never really get sick of it, so that's been working out really well, um, and then I also do stuff, like, sometimes it's a little bit more expensive at the food store, but it's so much more worth it for me, is, like, maybe if I want pineapple, but it's a pain in the butt to cut, like, I'll just buy the pre-cut pineapple or the shredded carrots like I'll just buy the bag that's already shredded or the mix of stir-fry veggies already together like I'll take those little shortcuts like it's going to save me spoons later then fine I'll pay the extra dollar for the package of it and go bloop okay there's my steamed vegetables and not have to sit there at the you know counter for 20 minutes chopping vegetables <laughs> it, like, it looks, looks like that really helps <laughs> Aside from sane leadership, 2020, all I like, I want Trader Joe's to decide to do like biologically proper packaging so that they don't have the single use plastic because that's so much more helpful to be able to buy the sliced pineapple, the sliced, you know, the shredded carrots, the, yeah. but I'm like looking at going, this is a world of plastic. I'm like, God, I, 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 between like being disabled and an environmentalist, like yeah. I'm going to lose my ever loving mind. I feel like I'm being torn in half all the time from like those issues, but you're right. It's, it's saying like the plastic straws, this was invented for us. Like these things were made for us so that we can feed ourselves so we can do these things and I'm trying really hard to like, let go of that and just go, I'm buying the thing that doesn't hurt. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I feel the same way that it's like, oh, I don't want to buy this plastic bag, but yeah, Trader you know, Joe's energy to yeah. step it up, Trader <laughs> Joe's. Don't make us feel so guilty. It's like the the new stuff that is not stay forever in our environment. That'd be great. <laughs> yes. Yeah, there's all kinds of like biodegradable different materials that they make stuff out of and. Things that look and feel just like plastic, but it's really like made out of avocado pits or yeah, whatever okay. random compostable <laughs> materials they have nowadays. And they have like stuff out of like corn, like the ethanol. It's like this is yeah. uh, this sounds pretty interesting. And there's like the bamboo, and then there's like other countries that package their like takeout food in like really neat things. So it's like the, it's, it look, there's there's ways. I just want Trader Joe's to step it up so I don't have to feel guilty all the time. That's really what yeah. that all came down to. <laughs> That's a great tip. What are some of the other ones? <laughs> you have the spoonie thing down. You need a blog, like how to spoonie. Um, also, just like not being afraid to ask for help. Um, I think part of it that's been tough is like now I'm more than a year after surgery. So like, of course, in the first couple months, people are like, what can I do? How can I help? But sometimes it's like, I might still have a bad day, even though it's been more than a year. People kind of forget and are like, oh, you're better, right? So sometimes I'm almost, like, embarrassed to, like, 
no, I am having a bad day. Can somebody help me with this? Um, so just like getting over those things mentally and making sure to ask, you know, a family member or a friend, somebody at work. Luckily, I have really helpful, nice coworkers. My other colleagues are great. Um, we have a lab tech position that's like a part-time um, person that helps all of us science teachers. So I make sure to try to sign up for him as much as I can. Um, we have like a shared document where we sign up for him. So I try to check like, okay, I'm not feeling so great today. Is he available? Okay, you know, period one and two, he's here. Let me put my name. And um, even if it's like not anything that big that I need his help with, I'm just like, can you just be here in the class with me? And, you know, maybe I need to go sit and maybe you can be the person to walk around and help them with the lab equipment or, or whatnot. So just making sure to have, you know, find that person and not be afraid to ask for the help when you need it and allow yourself to still have those times to sit and rest and, you know, if you need to use your heating pad or your ice pack or whatnot, then do it. Yes. <laughs> and how do you get the dogs walked? That's, that's actually my big question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, my husband does it a lot. Um, sometimes I can. So like part of my own physical therapy, I try to push myself a little bit to go. So I try to go like once a day. Usually the dogs get a walk twice a day. Um, my husband definitely does it twice. And then I try to go at least for one of the times. Um, kind of depends on the day though. Like if I'm having a bad day, if if we have a staff meeting and then I get stuck in traffic or something, I, I might just barely make it home and maybe maybe I don't walk them that day. But I try once a day, even if it's like we went through box through blocks and turned right around and came back. It's like, well, we had a little <laughs> walk and we did a little exercise. So um, try to do that. My husband does a lot. Um, my neighbors are great. You know, my next door neighbors have a key to our house. So if we ever need them to feed them or let them out or something, you know, I could just text them and be like, Hey, can you go let the dogs out? Can you go feed them? And, and they will. So fortunately I have a little group of people that I can count on to, you know, short text away and, and they'll, they'll jump at helping. So that's been really awesome. That is amazing. I'm deeply jealous. That is wonderful. That's like my biggest guilt is walking or not walking, but wheeling past my dogs and they're, um, giving me the sad puppy eyes. I'm like, oh, God, how do I? <laughs> so is there any other tips? You are really good at all the tips. <laughs> I, I, I want you to, like, start, like, some sort of, like, daily or, like, monthly blog post for us with here is the monthly spoony tip of the month. <laughs> that would be fantastic. <laughs> um, I guess part of it, though, is your diet really does make a difference. Um, so sometimes, of course... Sometimes I don't feel good and I'm just like, fine, let's just get takeout. And for the minute, I'm like, great, we got a meal and then immediately regret it. So um, trying to make sure you're eating things that will go okay with your medicine or, you know, with your stomach or whatever disorder you have. Um, trying your best to keep at least some fresh produce so that it's not all like processed stuff because that... It definitely makes a difference. If I'm eating junky food, I definitely feel way worse and get more bloated and, and achy and yucky. Um, so trying to do your best to, to eat well as much as you physically can prepare it. Um, you know, doing your best to try to eat well because it, it will definitely make you feel better if you can eat better and, and all that. Yeah, and like the Instapot or um, the slow cooker, yeah. like you could even go down to like any of the, the oh God, why can't I think of it? Um, Jesus Christ, I miss my words. Um, like secondhand stores will usually have Instapots or, or um, slow cookers and they can like, right. you can get anything you need to do and just get it done in the morning and... Yeah. Yeah, we used to do takeout, but we, we got the Instapot. Like my big thing is Indian food. I love Indian food. And with the Instapot, I made like the best butter sauce ever and I'm like okay we, we're good now we non-bread at Trader Joe's and we've got this and it has you know yeah so that's my my only tip is like absolutely with the slow cooker and the instapot right we also recently got a rice cooker so that's been helpful because we do a lot of rice dishes and stir fries and things and we usually would do it in the pot and have to stir it and you know I'd be standing there and getting tired cooking and then I'm like you know, with my meal prep friends, all of them had rice cookers. And I'm like, why don't we have one of these? It sounded so easy when I talked to them. So we did get one of those recently. So that's been helpful. So yeah, like any of those devices that you can just put the food in, click the button and walk away. Yeah. Or 
Um, sometimes, especially when I first went back to work, we did a lot of the meals that are, you mentioned Indian food, so it made me think of that, I like Indian food too. Um, at the food store we shop at has these like pre-made uh, like masala meals or like where they have the sauce and the lentils and mm-hmm. chickpeas and stuff in it. So it's like, well, you know, maybe we'd make rice ourselves and maybe add veggies to it or tofu or something, but then you just kind of pour that on and heat it up. So any of those little like easy meals make it so much better, you know, save you a little bit of energy here and there. And even if it's like, okay, that saved me five minutes here and five minutes there and five minutes here throughout the day, like you might wind up having an hour or more of energy later to then go walk the dogs or, you know, be able to have a conversation with somebody or... Or shower, that one. (laughs) shower. Maybe go out. I don't know. Uh, I (laughs) don't know what that would be like right now. Um, (laughs) Saving up spoons for showering right now. Um, Oh, and yeah, if you're um, like, okay, so I get an Instapot or a um, slow cooker, what do I do with it? Like Pinterest is amazing and free and oh my God. God, there's like, you will find out how to make anything on that. Or if you are more of a cookbook person, if you have a library card, you can get an app called Libby. And that's an international like library source. So they have all the ebooks right there. So you can like get any book, like almost any book on there, an ebook, and it just delivers to your device. And when it's, um, when your borrowing time is over, it just re- returns it automatically for you. It's oh, cool. so cool and free. It's part of the library. So that's my new little like happy discovery. I got all these cookbooks. I just went through like for a whole day when I was stuck in bed. I just checked out and returned cookbooks all day and saved the recipes. <laughs> that's really cool. Never heard of that. I, yeah. You know, it's so funny. It's like we were all like rushing over to Amazon and Kindle and Apple Books and uh, Google Play to buy our books. But yeah, we have this resource we've already paid for with our taxes, like the library. And the ebooks are the <laughs> same ones. And they have the same audiobooks on Libby. So the same audiobooks you would have to pay for on Audible, you can just rent on Libby for free. Very that's, neat. Yeah, that's my big, that's, that's my tip for the month. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Happy to help. You'll be all set. I, you can go through so many books that way. Oh, yes. All right. Well, I am actually fading so fast and I've popped my jaw out, so I should probably try to get that oh. back in. But if you re- it came up with any other tips, please send them over to me. I'll put them in the blog. It was okay. so nice to see you. I'm really happy we, we are able to stay in touch on social media, but it's not a substitute for saying hi. Yeah. All right. So good to hear from you. All right. Well, be kind, be gentle, and uh, wow, welcome 2020. Be a badass. I think we're all going to need it. 